So my name is Haley Katin Zarito. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I have my bachelor's in psychology from Campbell University and my master's in social work from University of Kentucky. Um, I'm recently fully licensed in Georgia. I've been here for three and a half years. One of the big theoretical approaches I use in my practice or with patients is cognitive behavior therapy, which is also CBT, um, because it can be used in a lot of different ways, depression, anxiety, um, personality disorders, some psychotic disorders if they have really good insight. Um, and it really puts the individual more in charge of their situation and their mood and their thoughts and, and it gives you more power and control. And so it helps empower the individual um, and also help understand yourself and where you're coming from and why you say some of the things you say, do some of the things you do and some of the patterns that play out over your lifetime. Cognitive behavior therapy, when you break it down, cognitive refers to the way that you think, your cognition. So thinking and feeling, how your brain works, um, where different parts of your brain are activated and how they influence the behavior. So the behavioral part. Um, your brain is your CPU. A lot of people say you're the computer, you know, it, governs all your movements, all your thinking, um, your feelings, a lot of things. And so the therapy part is breaking down how your thoughts and your feelings and your behavior affect your behaviors ultimately. Um, sometimes people have to work with the behavior and go backwards, but ultimately you get it your the point of it is to get more insight into why you do what you do and understand your thinking processes and where those come from. Your thoughts and your behaviors and your feelings are all connected. Usually it starts with an automatic thought. So she didn't call me back because she's angry with me. And then that may cause you to feel anxious or angry or disrespected or lonely. Um, and then that might cause you to act in a certain way. So relapse or yell and scream and approach the situation in a certain way because of how you think and you feel. Part of it is identifying the automatic thought, which can be really difficult sometimes because in the heat of the moment or when your emotions are high, but being able to break it down and identify that automatic thought and then attach, you know, name the feeling that's associated with it and then being able to work through it. So maybe she got busy or maybe she fell asleep or overslept or, you know, being able to kind of provide more rational thinking into that and take the personalization out of it um, can be helpful. You know, replacing that with something else and being able to think about the situation in a different way so you're, it's better to cope with it and it changes how you approach her or when you next see her um, and opens a way of communicating that is a lot more effective than yelling and screaming and acting out of that anger or that disrespect. Another part of CBT or that I like to work with patients in doing is using I statements. It's a form of assertive communication. And so that, you know, when you go through the different forms of communication, there's assertive, aggressive, and passive. And, you know, aggressive is obviously very intimidating, hostile, physically, you know, your posture is very physically aggressive or defensive. Um, passive is, you know, not answering the phone call because you're angry or not doing things that you normally do to, to get someone's attention or doing extra things to get someone's attention without actually communicating what's wrong. Um, and then there's assertive. So it's a lot of I statements, um, using respectful, calm language and posture and tone and different and volume. Um, so, you know, if you take your mom didn't put money on your books, like she said she was going to and being able to say, you know what, I've, my mom didn't put money on my books. I feel you know, lonely or neglected. Being able to communicate that to her next time you talk to her and saying, you know, I feel this way when you don't do what you said you were gonna do. And, you know, regardless of what she says in return, you're kind of speaking for yourself, respectful, calm. You open up the window for a, commun a conversation rather than a negative confrontation or aggressive confrontation. Um, but in that moment, before you're able to talk to her, obviously being able to say, 
you know, maybe she got busy or maybe the car broke down or maybe she just doesn't have it. Um, and how can I cope with this? And cause it's not gonna, you can be angry and punch the cell wall or punch another inmate or, you know, speed off in your car when you get out and do all these different things, but it doesn't change the fact that you still don't have money on your books. And so being able to find ways to cope with that and think about it in a different way and not necessarily rationalizing or justifying it because you're still hurt and that's still, you, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't feel how you feel, um, but sometimes being able to change how you think about it can change how you feel and then ultimately change how you act about it. Once you can understand, you know, this is how I act in these situations, you'll understand your triggers. That's a big thing too. Um, knowing what triggers you. And, and they use this a lot in substance abuse too, but it works, you know, every day we get triggered by something. Um, someone cuts you off on the road or your kid threw something or your ex shows up at your house unexpected or you see somebody that you used to use with or associate with in the store. It's gonna trigger a whole bunch of things that are going on. Your head's, you know, your mind's gonna start racing. You're gonna start having all these thoughts. So when you take that thought, and you might not know how you feel at first. It might take some time and that's, it's good to take time. If you tell somebody, like if you're in a confrontation and your mind might be racing and you might not be able to slow down those thoughts to understand what's going on. And that's because you're in a stress response. You feel threatened. And so your body is physiologically responding. And so the smart parts of your brain just sh shut down because you don't need them in a fight or flight situation. Jail doesn't always give you the time to to take time to yourself or the opportunity to take time for yourself. Um, but being able to, to try to find a way to step away from the situation and process it and give your, you know, think about it and say, well, when she said this, you know, my body responded. So I must have felt attacked or angry. Um, and then, yeah, under, you know, anger is typically thought of as a secondary emotion. And so there's something underneath that anger. There's the thing we use, or I like to use, is the anger iceberg. Um, and so, you know, the parts of an iceberg you see on the water is only 20%. And that's what the anger is. And so underneath is underneath the water is all that other stuff, all the rest of the iceberg. Disrespect, lonely, angry, hungry, tired, um, embarrassed, stressed. Being able to identify that emotion and saying, you know, because you're not wrong for how you feel, but it can be irrational. And so part of it is deciding, is this feeling rational? Is it rational for me to think that my mom doesn't love me because she didn't call me? Well, no, because there's all these other things that are going on. You know, you find evidence to support that. And if you can find evidence, it makes it a, ra you know, more rational thought. Um, and if you, if you ask yourself, well, what other ways does she love me? Or what other ways does she show me she doesn't love me? And you don't have any then maybe that's just a bad day for her or a bad day for you. Maybe you're stressed because you got stuff on the inside going on, you got stuff on the outside going on, and this was the, you know, the trigger that just boiled it all over. And so also being able to understand that, that, you know, we have a lot going on in life, no matter where you're at. And so, you know, you could be stressed out at work and then you come home and your wife starts yelling at you because the kid did this, that, and the other, but you're still stressed from work. And so you're not gonna be the best person to cope with that stuff at home than you would be if you had taken some time and understand, you know, I'm stressed because of work. I'm not mad at you. I understand that these stuff, this stuff happens with kids and, you know, we have to work on this together. And with CBT, with identifying that automatic thought, it is like if this, if, you know, an officer yells at you and you just got off the phone with your baby mama and she's screaming and yelling at you because you're not paying child support. Reason why well, you're not making any money right now. Um, so you're already upset about that. Maybe your mom's got health problems and you're stressed about that. And then an officer yells at you to tuck your shirt in. And, you know, the automatic thought might be, why is this guy yelling at me? Um, it's just an untucked shirt. It's not that big of a deal. So that might be your automatic thought is saying, you know, it might be an expletive. There might be some more choice words in that automatic thought. Um, but you take that thought and you're like, well, is he yelling at me because my, am I reacting like this because he's yelling at me or am I reacting like this because I'm already stressed about all these other things I have going on? With that automatic thought, it might make you feel disrespected. Um, and so finding rational evidence. So is he disrespecting me or am I not following the rules? Am I not doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And he's enforcing them. 
that's rational. That's what he's doing. Regard I understand it doesn't always look like that. And, you know, officers may not always do what they're supposed to do, but that's not your responsibility. You know, understanding why he's doing what he's doing. He's doing his job, telling you to tuck your shirt in. Um, and you might be reacting so strongly because you have these other things going on. And so being able to slow yourself down and say, you know, why is this guy talking to me like that? Well, he might just be doing his job. And so, you know, I feel, you know, going back to I feel disrespected. Well, I feel disrespected because I feel like men aren't supposed to yell like that. All he has to do is ask me nicely. Um, and that that's probably true, but we can't control that stuff that's going on around us and how people re react to us and, and talk to us. So your responsibility is how you react to them and how you handle yourself. And so, you know, saying I feel disrespected. Well, I don't have to match his disrespect with aggression. I don't have to, you know, disrespect him to make the playing field even. I know a lot of times people like to, um, if they hurt me, I'm gonna hurt them back. Um, and that's a good point too. If you feel hurt, or you feel shamed because you're in jail and um, these people have power over you and you have limited freedom, it, that causes a lot of emotional and mental strain on somebody. Um, but, it, you know, also understanding the dynamics in jail are different than the free world. But um, but still, like, if you're, if you're feeling is feeling disrespected, you know, you can communicate to that officer, hey, all you have to do is ask me nicely. I don't need you to, I, I don't like when you yell at me or, but, but using jail is a good example for preparing yourself for the free world because just like in, you know, anywhere, you can't control what other people do. So if the cashier in a grocery store is short with you and curt and nasty and just throwing your groceries all over the place, that might make you feel some type of way. Like, those are my eggs. Like, how am I supposed to cook dinner if all my eggs are smashed? And so it might make you feel angry and, you know, why is she disrespecting me like this? Um, but are you really being disrespected or do you just feel like that? One of the things that we use in CBT, one of the exercises, I typically assign it for homework, but if we can do it verbally in session, we will. Um, so you'll take this thought record and you'll think of the situation so, you know, I yelled at my three-year-old, which woke up the baby who wouldn't stop crying. That's the situation. Um, the emotion or feeling attached with that is, you know, I feel 90% angry at myself, at my kids, at my husband, 90% um, sad and 70% guilty or ashamed um, for yelling at my kid. And the automatic thought would be, I must be a very bad person to not be happy to have healthy kids. Um, and you'll feel like a 90% certainty that that's a true thought. Um, and so when you're looking for evidence, and so what could be underneath that automatic thought is, well, any mom, any decent mother loves her kids no matter what. So that might be adding into the, the negative emotions with it. Um, or it could be a good person would feel happy with a healthy baby. Um, evidence that does not support the thought you're a bad person. So I've always cared for my family and friends. Like when you think back, you know, I cook dinners, I pay bills, I help my mom, I help my dad. Um, another piece of evidence, I usually try to do good for others. Um, you know, I'm only a phone call away from my friends. Anytime someone needs me, I do the most that I can for them. Um, and then one more could be people that know me don't think I'm a bad person. Um, so if you got friends and family and different people in your life, there's a reason that you're in their life. And so there's evidence to say that you're, you have some good in you somewhere. Um, and so finding a balance between those, um, or a balanced thought would be, I'm an okay person, I'm a decent human being, I just feel overwhelmed because I have two young children and I'm at home with them all day by myself. And that can be very overwhelming uh, under ideal circumstances. And so being able to replace the I'm a bad person for yelling at my kids with I'm a decent person who's just experiencing a hard time in life. Um, can reduce those feelings of sadness, guilt, shame that you initially felt in this situation. What I'd like you guys to do is think of a situation in your life that's been very stressful. One uh, like uh, isolated incident. So 
think of an isolated incident in your life where it caused negative feelings or, you know, you got real bent out of shape about it and then go through what we just went through with this worksheet. What I also encourage patients to do is a gratitude list. So a lot of times with anxiety and depression and life in general, people feel stressed and humans are ingrained with this negativity bias evolutionarily, you know, kept us alive, but we don't necessarily need it anymore, but we do tend to put more weight into negative experiences or negative situations than good experiences. And so I like to talk, to ask people to do a gratitude list. So at some point in the day, or you know, maybe when you start your day, in the middle of your day, the end of your day, make a short list, three to five things of things that are going right. Um, maybe you matched your clothes today or your shoes, you know, you bought new shoes or you had a good day at work or your kid passed tests or, you know, think of something good that happened in your life. Um, and be mindful of the good that there is good. The world is not all bad. Um, and then I also, you know, with that, if feasible, you know, journaling is really good. Um, journaling can help you process through your day or, you know, certain situations. And then it can offer, you know, an opportunity to see how far you've grown and see how much you've accomplished over a period of time. Or if you re-experience a difficult situation, referring back, you know, I know in October I went through something like this. How did I feel about it then? And being able to either use past accomplishments and overcoming certain situations to help you in the, you know, the present. One of my patients that I'm working with has a baby, an ex who is now, a, um, they were never married, it's an ex-boyfriend, but they have a child together and, and he's eight years old. So he's still fairly dependent on each of them and not really quite able to make his own decisions as far as his care. Um, but she has a really difficult time because she has expectations for her child's father that while reasonable and you know, you wouldn't think are difficult or causing her a lot of distress because he's not respecting that or he's not giving her what she needs. And so part of it, you know, like she wants to know when he moves from point A to point B or what do you, you know, did he eat dinner? Did he do his homework? Different things like that. Um, but what ultimately is going on is she wants to maintain some type of relationship with this guy because she feels scared to be alone. And so she's kind of holding on to this relationship that's not healthy for her to hold on to um, because of these things that are going on within her. The ultimate goal of CBT is to be able to identify your current ways of thinking and behaving and how, you know, the consequences and different ways that you've gotten to your life and changing them so that you're able to live a healthier, happier, more insightful, you know, you, you understand yourself better and where you're coming from, where these all this garbage is coming from. Um, being more aware of it and then changing what you can and coping with or accepting different things that you can't. So I know that I've, I've talked a lot about CBT. There are other ways of solving problems. So, um, you know, when you get out and you're starting to explore, you know, maybe I do need some help or I want to get a better understanding of who I am. There's more than one way to do that. Um, and there's gonna be multiple providers, you know, like I have other tools in my toolbox. I have, you know, there's other things to do. Um, so when you're seeking treatment and you're seeking a therapist, asking them like, what's your treatment of choice or what do you like to do with patients or how do you help people? Um, and getting a better understanding of what they can offer you. Um, there are, um, you know, various places you can go with around this area. Um, and a lot of them take sliding scale. So if you don't have insurance, um, or you have Medicaid, there are still options for you. So I currently work with primary health care centers. Um, we do offer behavioral health treatment for established patients, medical patients. Um, we also offer case management. And so if you need help getting insurance or getting food stamps or different things, we have people that can help you with that. If you need referrals for behavioral health, if you're not an established patient, we can also help with that. Um, but there is also Georgia Hope and Lookout Mountain Community Services that I'm familiar with. Um, I know Chattanooga has a lot of options. Um, Dalton has pro family. Um, there's Hamilton health systems that's in Dalton that can help too. So with getting treatment, a lot of it is gonna be a process. Obviously getting out of jail is going to be a process and you're gonna be navigating a whole lot of different things in life. Um, 
the most important thing is obviously get yourself a stable place to live, shelter over your head. A problem that we encounter a lot is people will be on our medical side getting, you know, insulin or getting their labs done. And they're like, oh, I'm going through all these other things in life. And they're like, oh, you should go to counseling. But they're not in a place where they can go to counseling because they're worried about all these other things that kind of fall into those first two levels. And in getting out of jail, if you're not ready for counseling, if you have all these other things that you have to worry about and get settled down before you can seek counseling, um, developing healthier coping skills. So ways of dealing with this stress and this feeling, those feelings of being overwhelmed and maybe lost or scared or lonely. Um, healthier coping skills than what you've probably been using before. Um, exercise, meditating. There's a bunch of YouTube videos for meditating and, and yoga and different things. When getting out of jail, counseling might not be able to be your first step. You might have to get all these other things settled and squared away before you can go to counseling and commit to going to counseling regularly because it does take a lot of work and it's a big life change. Um, so taking time now to identify those triggers and those situations um, that, you know, I know ultimately could lead to relapse and could lead to old behaviors and poor choices um, and getting a better understanding of, you know, cause you're gonna go back out to probably gonna end up back in those communities. And so understanding, you know, the whole people, places and things that you have to avoid and replacing them with healthier people, places, and coping skills. And so diet is a big thing. Your mind and body are connected. So you put garbage in, you're probably gonna get garbage out. So trying to be mindful of what you're eating and drinking, um, exercising, going for a walk, getting out in the sun. Um, vitamin D deficiency can mimic symptoms of depression. So getting some sunlight can be good for you. Um, finding, if you have a healthy support person, somebody, talking to them regularly. Um, journaling, meditating. There's a lot of YouTube videos um, on meditating, yoga. You can go to the library, read some books. Reading is a good coping skill, distracting you from real life. Um, and then once you're in a stable situation or you know you have housing, you have a job and you know a little more established and you're ready for counseling, you already have all these tools and you already have all this work done to bring to counseling and you know a counselor can help you make it all make sense or put it all together and continue stepping, you know, on your journey to healthier you, better you. So if you grew up in an area where drug use was normal or that's just what people did, or, um, you know, when people screamed and yelled and they fought, which conflict is normal, it's, it, you know, people fight, people disagree. But if you watched people growing up throw things and punch each other and then they would get drunk and everything would calm back down. Maybe that's just what you have associated alcohol with is calmness and quiet and, um, or it could, and there's a lot of genetics that go into it. There's research to say that there's, you know, if you have a family history of drug use, you're more, you have a predisposition to potentially being addicted to substances. Um, and then, you know, relationships, you know, we trust people and they, you know, they give a, they have the power to hurt us. They know our vulnerabilities. They know our triggers. They know what's important to us. Um, and for whatever reason, things might not work out and you feel hurt and sad and lonely. So you might hook up with somebody that uses drugs to cope with their life. And you're like, Hey, just, you know, that sounds so cliche, but you know, just try it. Maybe it'll help you. Um, and then it just kind of spirals from there. CBT can help you understand, you know, I feel lonely because this relationship didn't work out. Um, and it might not have worked out for a whole host of reasons. Maybe it just wasn't, two people just weren't compatible or, you know, both people are bringing toxic baggage to the situation. And so being able to understand what did I bring to this situation that affected this relationship? Is it because, you know, I feel worthless because of what my mom said to me when I was growing up or because I don't have a dad, I'm not worth having a happy relationship or, you know, people make all kinds of associations with different things. And so part of the CBT is understanding those associations and those thoughts and, and being able to replace them and change them with more realistic and rational thinking, which can ultimately change how you act, your behaviors. And so you might, you know, when you feel stressed, you might start exercising instead of smoking meth or smoking weed or whatever. If you take the example of, I always end up with these crazy women or crazy men or however, um, there could be other traits in those individuals or other 
associations you've made that are attract like you're attracted like a, a common thing as people want to fix other people they think that if i just help him or if i love him enough and hug him enough and cook for him he's gonna love me and maybe because at some point in your life you felt accepted or valued as a person because of a service you provided so maybe you were a really good mom now your kids are grown so or your kids were taken or different situations where that you still have those instincts or those connections that at this point I was worth being a person because I did these things. And so you might be looking for someone who needs fixing or someone who needs repairing and, you know, wanting that to make you feel like a whole person. With that situation, CBT will help you understand why you think that you need to be doing these things and help you, you know, explore that and um, get a little bit deeper. Like I'm unworthy unless I'm providing a service to somebody um, and helping you replace that with, no, I can still help somebody, but a and understanding what a healthy relationship is. So, you know, therapy in general can help you understand what a healthy relationship is, but CBT will help you recognize what you're bringing to the situation and why you do what you do. Um, so you can be a better person for a healthier relationship. That's why I like it. It's pretty straightforward. Like thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all connected. And then there's obviously fuel to those fires. And so you kind of explore a little bit deeper through your history and your relationships and different situations you've experienced, um, places you've been, things you've done and why that contributes to how you think now. Um, and so the point of therapy in general is to get a better understanding of who you are, but then how you can use that to make a better future, make a better way of thinking and doing things.